Welcome to the IUN Community Garden, putting the garden to bed for the winter. Our presenter today is Dolly Foster. Dolly is a landscape horticulturalist and has been a master gardener for 22 years, an Indiana accredited horticulturalist for 20 and a certified arborist since 2008. For the past 22 years, Dolly has been presenting lectures on many gardening topics. She spent a few years as an adjunct faculty member in the Juliet Junior College Agriculture slash Horticultural Department and for 18 years in the parks and recreation industry as staff horticulturalist for two park districts. She also managed the Oak Lawn Community Garden. Dolly has been butterfly gardening from the very beginning of her gardening career. Her passion has led her to raising monarch and swallowtail butterflies, which she has done for the past 15 years. And her garden at home has been a monarch way station since 2011. Welcome Dolly, we're so glad to have you with us today. Thank you very much. I'm really happy to be here. All right, so we're going to talk about putting your beds to bed for the winter. And uh, I'm mostly going to be talking about perennial gardens, but if you have any questions about the vegetable garden, put them in the chat and we will address them at the end. Um, I'm not going to focus on it, but I can talk about it if you have questions. So let's get started. Um, the first thing I usually do when I start thinking about what I'm going to do in the garden to uh, clean up for the winter, which I don't do a whole lot, but um, I will go out and take an inventory. And what I want to make clear to you is that everything that I'm going to talk about today is just an idea and a suggestion, things that you can do to make spring easier for you. This is not necessarily, you know, don't take it as a mandatory list of things that you have to do in your garden in the fall in order to have a healthy garden. These are just things that you can do that will make things easier later on. You by no means have to do everything on this list. So with that, um, the first thing I usually do is go outside and I take some walk around and, and while I'm working outside in the late summer, I'll usually kind of think about this list of, oh, I have to do this before winter, I have to do that. So go out and take a walk around and make a list of things that you need to do, inventory what you need to do, um, you know, prioritize those tasks so that, um, you know, if you don't have a lot of time, because this is kind of late for me to do this lecture. I wrote this lecture um, for the very first time because I was gonna give a lecture in August. And this was, you know, gosh, like 10, 12 years ago that I gave this lecture for the first time. So really you wanna try and pretend in your head that we're in August um, because that's when you would start some of these tasks. So get out there, make a list, prioritize. And then one of the first things that you'll want to do is make sure that you do a really thorough weeding of the garden if you're able to. And this, um, if you're going to get out there and weed, especially the annual weeds before they go to seed, the, you know, the kind of cool season or warm season weeds that are going to be going to seed in the fall, you're going to want to uh, make sure you weed those out, but then also weed the perennial weeds one more time. There are, the, the weeds on this list are weeds that I will usually at work be um, pulling, you know, two or three times a year. Sometimes we spray at work um, at my old job, but not anymore. Um, so mostly it's just making sure that some of these things get pulled a couple times a year because it weakens them. It makes them, if they're constantly pulling energy from their roots, then eventually that plant is going to get weakened and it's going to die. So some of those things that you're going to want to weed before winter are uh, thistle and specifically Canadian thistle, because that's the, the invasive thistle that has rhizomes under the ground and it just kind of spreads. Those rhizomes are so deep. Don't anticipate being able to dig them out because you would never be able to dig up your whole garden to get them all. So it's best to pull that weed, you know, two, three times a year. And after a couple of years, it's going to weaken. Uh, you're going to want to pull spurge, horse nettle, uh, which Amanda has told me about today that they have over at the community garden and it's a pretty tenacious weed. Bindweed, nightshade is another really bad one. Um, bindweed is a really bad one. Bindweed will take a long time for you to get rid of, uh, but it, it is doable, but you really, you have to pull it not two or three times a year, but you gotta get out there and pull it almost every week. Uh, I was able to eliminate it 
almost completely from one of my beds. It's a really small bed, so it, there wasn't a lot of it in it. Um, but I really kept on it last year because I was kind of home almost the whole summer. And um, it did the trick. I didn't have to pull it nearly as much this year. So it is controllable, but you really have to be attentive to it. Nightshade, the same way. It has a more shallow root though. Nightshade is a little bit easier to get, but you just have to make sure to get the whole root. Garlic mustard we know is a, bi is a biennial. And so right now, if you have garlic mustard in your garden, you will see just the leaves. And these leaves are kind of coin shaped and they're serrated on the edge. And if you crush it, it smells like garlic. And what that means is that if you have the leafy part of the plant growing right now, then uh, next year you're going to have flowers and you definitely wanna try and prevent those flowers. So with garlic mustard, if you miss a couple, uh, you don't have to worry about it as long as you are pulling those up before the flowers go to seed the next year. Plantain, same thing. Um, it won't be blooming right now, but as long as you get it before the seeds are set next spring, you'll be okay with it. Burdock is another really um, tenacious weed. It doesn't spread except by seeds. But the thing is, is that burdock has a really long taproot. And if you've never seen burdock before, I guarantee you have, because you've walked out in your garden at least once in your gardening career and said, I don't remember planting rhubarb. How did I get rhubarb in my garden? And that's because it's burdock, not rhubarb. They look a lot alike. Uh, burdock, the only part of burdock that I know of that is edible is the root and it's a medicinal herb. So unless you're gonna make some kind of tincture out of the burdock for a medicinal purpose, you're gonna wanna get rid of it because once the seeds form, they create a burr, hence the name burdock. And the burrs will attach onto your skin. Um, if you have bare skin, they'll attach onto your clothing. And that's how those uh, seeds get traveled around the environment by animals. Um, but the worst thing that's ever happened to me in my gardening life was getting about 25 of those burrs stuck in my hair. So you don't ever want that to happen because um, they're extremely difficult to get out. And then pokeweed is another one with a really big, long uh, taproot. And right now the pokeweed has purple berries on it and it has a pink stem, green leaves, and is very easy to identify. Um, it's very exotic looking, but it is a native. It's a native from our Southern states. Um, it's edible really early in the spring. The leaves are edible. And then, um, but for the rest of the year, it's a really big pest. So you wanna get rid of those. So all of those on that list, not easy to control unless you keep up on it. So that's why I say that um, fall control of these guys with just weeding is really helpful to you. And then some of the other weeds that are really important for you to get rid of out of the garden are gonna be things like uh, farm grass, barnyard grass, it's the other name for it, foxtail grass, black medic. Black medic is a weed that when, when you're looking at it, you say, wow, that kind of looks like clover, but not really. And it has small, tiny black seeds on a little kind of a cone-shaped um, seed uh, head. It doesn't really have a seed pod. And so black medic, also another medicinal herb if you're into foraging, um, but if you don't want it, then you got to dig it out. That one, you definitely have to dig out some of the roots because they will come back. It's It can be it can be perennial like. Another thing to do is fall lawn care. Now, if you have crabgrass in your garden, I, this is, and this is why I say this is a little late to do this lecture, but for next year, try and remember this. If you have crabgrass in your garden in fall or in your lawn rather, you wanna try and mow it down before it starts to set seed. So if it's in a certain place in your yard where um, it kind of, congregates and you know you get it in a big clump and um, you have a big area of it if it's not in your lawn try and cut it with your lawnmower or cut it with some other kind of tool to get rid of those stems before the seeds are formed that will really help cut down on next year's crabgrass and then um, I'm sure the question in your mind is right now how do I know if I have crabgrass in my lawn well, you're not going to see the plants very clearly right now. 
However, if you have sparrows landing in your lawn in big groups and they're eating something in your lawn, they're eating crabgrass seeds right now. So that could be a good uh, indicator to you that you might have to put down some crabgrass preventer in the spring. Crabgrass preventer is a really good product. Um, I know we like to go all organic in all of our gardens and um, I try to go organic in my garden all the time. Uh, crabgrass preventer, however, is one thing that I don't compromise on. A lot of people in my neighborhood don't really uh, treat their lawns for anything. They don't really put down weed preventer. They kind of just let their lawns go natural. And um, the problem with that is that crabgrass can just get spread all over the whole neighborhood. So I've always used crabgrass preventer. And all it is is a pre-emergent that prevents the crabgrass seeds from germinating. That's it. That's all this thing does. It shouldn't kill anything under the ground. It should not kill any insects under the ground because that's not its job. Its job is not to kill anything. Its job is to prevent seeds from germinating and only the crabgrass seeds. Um, in the fall, back in September, is the time to apply the broadleaf weed control. And if you're going to be using that, and then in November is when you're going to want to put down some slow release nitrogen for the winter. So you put that down around Thanksgiving. Aerate your lawn at this time of the year. It's still good, a uh, good time of the year right now. So if you have uh, clay soil under your lawn and your lawn looks like it's maybe not growing as lush as you would like it to, you know, maybe you're in new construction, your construction has um, scraped away all your topsoil and given you back two inches for your lawn. Aeration and a top dressing of compost is a way to really improve that soil situation. And if you aerate once a year or once every couple of years, then um, over, you know, over five years, you're really gonna see improvement in your lawn. And then clean up your leaves on your lawn. Don't leave leaves on your lawn over the winter because they will kind of uh, congregate in, um, clumps, they'll blow around, and wherever they blow around and sit for the winter, they will kill your grass. So uh, my husband chose to do that as an experiment one year, and he had to buy three pieces of sod the next spring. So make sure that you don't leave any leaves on the lawn. All right, now on to the perennial garden. Lots of debate about perennials and what we do with them in our garden now. Uh, for a long time, I have been a very devoted pollinator gardener. That means that my garden is uh, almost 100% dedicated to native uh, butterflies, native bees, wasps, um, army beetles, other beetles. I've even had staghorn beetles in my garden. I'm trying to look at the picture and think of what I see in my garden. I have lots of insects in my garden. I even get lightning bugs. And um, and crickets, lots and lots of crickets. So one of the things that helps your insect life over the winter is to leave your garden up for winter. In the photograph that you're looking at of my garden, that's really pretty much how it looks all winter and every winter. Um, this picture was probably taken in November. And I leave the stems up because we have 400 species of native bees in Indiana, in Illinois. And um, of those, there are about 30% that actually lay their eggs in the stems of our perennial plants. I've seen evidence of this in my garden. Hopefully you'll be able to see this. This is the stem of a cup plant. And I'm hoping that you can see the holes in it. The holes in it are from little bees making their um, nesting holes for the winter. So I found this a couple of years ago at work and I have cut plant here at home and I've seen the holes in the cut plant and common milkweed, coneflower, a couple of other things. There's a lot of different plants that the bees are looking for to dig into that have a nice pithy center or, um, or a semi hollow center, which cut plant kind of has a little bit of a hollow center. And uh, if we take away our garden stems in the fall, then those bees have no way to propagate themselves for the next winter. They will have to move on to somewhere else where there are other garden stems to do that. And if your neighborhood is like mine, where there's only a few people who have perennial gardens, in fact, 
I think there's only, there's me and my uh, neighbor, Dan, and, that have really big gardens and then nobody else has big gardens like we do. So if these bees couldn't find somewhere to lay their eggs in our neighborhood, they would seek elsewhere. And then we wouldn't have those bees in our neighborhood because they stay really close to home. Bees will stay within, you know, depending on the size of the bee, they'll stay within, you know, 50 meters to 150 to 500 meters of where they're born. So they really do stay close to home. There are reasons to cut certain things down in the garden. Um, we'll talk about a little bit of that. So some advantages of cutting back is, first of all, it saves time in the spring to clean up. So if you know that something is going on in your uh, calendar in the spring and you know like you're going to be gone for a month, you're a, um, you know, you're a, a Florida person for the winter and you know you're going to be gone until like the first of May or something like that. So cutting down your garden at this time of the year could just totally make sense for you. Um, it makes mulching easier if you're going to do full garden mulching in the winter. So, you know, I'd say about every five years or so, I will completely cut down my whole garden just to, just to clean things up and um, be able to evaluate the garden, to look at what's underneath the, the stems in the garden, do a little bit of mulching. I don't do a whole lot of mulching. Uh, planting bulbs is a lot easier if you don't have all the stems of your plants up. Uh, I do encourage you, if you are gonna clear out your garden to do some bulb planting, you know, leave stumps where your plants are. Leave, you know, three, four, five inches so that you know where there are some perennials so that you know where to dig and where not to dig. Um, but the one thing that I always take out of my garden every year are the diseased plants. So that's going to be peonies, uh, zinnias, my verbena, um, uh, which, which one is it? The blue vervain, verbena hastata. That one always gets powdery mildew. And then what else do I have in the garden that gets powdery mildew? There's a couple of other things that get powdery mildew. So, but mostly the first thing I do after the peonies um, bloom is I cut the peonies down because I know they're gonna get powdery mildew. They don't need to photosynthesize all, all summer long in order to get flowers the next year. And they have botrytis blight. So I try to make sure to get those at least. Don't put any of those diseased articles into your compost pile if you have one because you can't guarantee that your compost pile is going to get up to 160 to 180 degrees for a long enough period of time in order to kill the spores of those fungal diseases. So take advantage of your municipal landscape waste. Um, all of the landscape waste picked up by cities does go to uh, a central area, usually by, um, owned by a waste management company and they do hot composting in huge piles, absolutely enormous piles. It's really, it's kind of interesting to go watch them turn those big piles, I've seen it once. So some of the aesthetics of not cutting back are really beautiful when we have a nice snowy winter and I leave some of the things up. I love how the snow catches on my plants. Um, the snow is really good insulation for your new garden plants. So if you have new section of garden or some new plants or new shrubs that you've put in, definitely don't cut any of those back for the first winter, maybe even the second winter. Make sure that they have protection from wind and the stems give the protection from the wind. Um, leaving some of your plants up is going to be good food for wildlife. So you have uh, black eyed Susans and coneflowers and cup plant and other things like that, they have big obvious seeds, uh, viburnums in the shrub department and things like that. So if you have wildlife plants, make sure you don't cut them down, leave them up so you can feed uh, the wildlife. Some perennials to leave standing uh, for bird food will be black-eyed Susan's coneflowers, sweet autumn clematis, I don't know. I have seen cardinals feeding on the sweet autumn cl clematis seeds, but for me, sweet autumn clematis is a big weed in my garden and I'm continuously every spring trying to get rid of some of them. I have like seven of them and it's just too much. And so I do see the cardinals 
picking and poking at the seeds, but it, they never seem to eat enough to make keeping all of those vines up over the winter worth it. So use your own judgment on that one. If you only have one sweet autumn clematis and you don't mind a few seedlings and you can catch those seedlings next summer uh, and get rid of them, then you can leave it up. You know, leave it up if you want to. Uh, Liatris, blazing star, is a really good bird uh, food plant. And it has a nice thick stem. Uh, some of the bigger varieties like um, Liatris uh, scariosa, Newlandii, that's a really good uh, variety that gets large. It gets really tall. It's about five feet tall sometimes. And uh, the nice thing about them is that they have a really thick stem at the bottom. And the down at the bottom is where you're going to see these bees uh, holes. This, um, this stem that I have here, this was not from the top of a plant. This was at the base of the stem. So it's really far down. So wherever the thicker the thickest part of the stem is, that's where the bees are going to go. Milkweed um, doesn't necessarily have a whole lot of uh, bird action on it as far as the seeds go, but um, the stems are really good for the little bees. Cup plant again and Heliopsis. Now the only thing I would discourage you about Heliopsis is if um, everybody loves native plants, I love native plants, Heliopsis is not one of my favorite native plants mostly because it has a tendency to spread a lot. But if you have a big area where you want it and you're really into bird gardening, then Heliopsis could be a good choice for you. Just, just be warned that it's gonna spread a lot. Now, this is a really interesting handout. Um, this graphic is from a handout that you guys are all gonna get. And it is a handout um, about stem nesting bees. And the, this is the annual cycle of what you are going to do with your stems. So over the winter, you leave your stems up, that's up at the top in the spring. Those stems are gonna get cut back, but only between like 12 and 24 inches. So you're basically, you're just gonna go through and cut the tops off of all your perennials. And this year was the first year I actually had time to kind of take my time, go through the garden and, and do this. And what I did was, um, cut off the tops of the stems. If I didn't see a lot of holes in the stems, then I cut those stems up like the common milkweed. I cut them up as mulch in the garden, and then I left other ones just intact on the ground in the summertime. And then the, the stumps that you leave up, you never cut them down. Those stumps you can see in the summer graphic, you can see the old stems that are brown in the center of the flowers. That's last year's stems. You just leave them alone. They will eventually rot at the base and fall over and become part of the decay cycle of the garden. And that's a good thing because that's how soil is built. So the new, new growth comes up in the summer. We have flowers in the fall. We have flowers with seeds. Those seeds get eaten by the birds. And then the winter time, we have the stems staying up over the winter again, most likely with last year's stems. So it seems like at some point your plants might get kind of congested with old stems. And if they do, if you feel like they do, then at that point, if you grab those stems and you kind of rock them back and forth, whatever's rotted is gonna come off when you rock back and forth in the spring. And then um, just leave them on the garden floor. Just put them down on the garden floor. But you can see how the bees on the right-hand side of this graphic, you can see how the bees, um, make a hole, they make a hole in the side of the stem and then they're going to make a cavity, lay an egg, put down some pollen, then they make a barrier with plant material and then lay another egg, stuff it with pollen, which is the food for the larva, and then cap it off with some more plant material and then they eventually cap off the whole thing and seal it. So I, I find it absolutely fascinating. Um, and I had always heard for many years in the pollinator world, you know, taking lots of classes about pollinators, that we should leave our stems up for, for winter, but no one ever explained it like this. No one ever explained that the bees actually lay their eggs in the bottom third or the bottom half of the stem, and that has to remain intact. Now, if for some reason you are going to clean up completely in the springtime and cut those stems down at the base, you can bundle them up and stand them up in an obscure corner in your garden 
or an obscure place on your property and the bees will still hatch. But it's most important that those stems don't get crushed. All right, some other perennials to leave standing for a completely different reason. And this would be because the plants on this list do not come up until almost June 1st. And that's because they are triggered by the soil temperature, not the amount of light that is coming on them. They like warm soil, they are warm season plants, and they won't come up first thing, uh, you know, when the soil is like 45 to 50 degrees. In April, you won't see them. You won't see them until the soil temperature is possibly um, in the mid 60s, and that's going to be towards the beginning of June, uh, end of May, beginning of June. Now, if we have a cold, wet spring, they're going to come up a little bit later. So if you leave the stems up of these guys or label your plants, then um, you won't lose them. You won't dig into them. I think the most horrifying thing I ever saw when I was working in a garden center was uh, a customer of mine had bought, you know, like six beautiful um, hardy hibiscus that, you know, had the really big dinner plate flowers. And then the next spring, she brought them back in April and said they were dead, but they weren't dead. She had dug them up before they were ever supposed to emerge. So we told her, just take them home and put them back in the ground and they'll be fine. And as far as I know, they lived, um, but who knows? There are some shrubs and perennials that you are going to want to prune because they have seeds and you don't necessarily want those seeds to spread. And I would say that this is probably the worst offender of all of them. This is, um, oh God, blackberry lily. <laughs> um, so blackberry lily, butterfly bushes like this, black eyed Susan will put down a lot of seeds. As far as the natives go, let's see, ironweed will put down a lot of seeds. Um, cup plant, oh my gosh, cup plant. Right now the finches are still working on the, the ends of my cup plant stems but inevitably they have knocked a lot of seeds down on the ground. So I always end up with a lot of uh, cup plant seedlings. So if you do have cup plant, make sure that you collect those seedlings in the spring and don't let them all grow. Um, butterfly bushes, if you have an older butterfly bush, you might still end up with a seedling or two um, every couple of years. They really don't have a lot of fertile seeds and the brand new varieties that are the dwarf varieties now that are out on the market that are kind of new, those are sterile. Those are not gonna make seeds at all. I've never seen a seed. Uh, the companies are saying they're sterile. Um, you know, if you're going for a very pure native garden, then you don't wanna have a butterfly bush at all. But I don't, I, I mix natives and non-natives in my garden. I have a couple of butterfly bushes. Um, they are by far a very small portion of my uh, perennials that bloom at the end of the summer for the, the bees and the butterflies. And so I don't think there's any harm in having one or two, if you like the way they look and it's, you know, and it's possible in the next year or two, if they, if it doesn't come back from a harsh winter, I might not replace them. Uh, let's see some other things to do in the garden, take out your annuals if they recede too much. Um, and if you don't want them in the garden next year, a lot of annuals are hybrids. And if they do come back the next year, they're going to be different than what you planted last year because annuals um, that are hybrids are not always true to seed. So you don't necessarily want to let them reseed and you don't necessarily want them, um, you necessarily don't want to collect their seeds. Fall perennial care. So going back in time, if we go back to August, we wanna make sure that perennials are not being fertilized after August 15th and quite possibly way back at August 1st. I don't think that I, I don't think I fertilize any perennials past about 4th of July because I just don't feel like I need to. If you feel like you need to, um, I would say one perennial plant, one shrub, that you would want to keep repeating your fertilizer regime would be on is Nico Blue and Endless Summer Hydrangeas. They are very hungry feeders. They need a lot of feed during the summer to keep them blooming and to actually get them blooming. So if you've had those hydrangeas and they've never bloomed for you, then it's going to be next year is going to be a time where you're going to want to plan on it. But August 1st, August 15th, that's where you have to stop because uh, plants like those hydrangeas 
and perennial plants are making buds for next spring on the crown of their plant. The crown is the portion of tissue where the stems and the roots come together. And the buds are being formed on that crown tissue um, in August and early September. And if you continue to fertilize, then they're continue to put out flowers and want to make seeds. And they won't be putting energy into making the buds for next year. And the buds all have to be made before winter sets in so that you have um, that plant next year. So you have, and each bud is going to correspond with a stem. So if you've had, I don't know, um, if you have balloon flower and it has two stems this year, if you want it to further expand and mature and get bigger and have three to four stems next year, possibly five, those buds have to be made in August. But if you keep fertilizing it, it might not be able to do that. It might just expend all of its energy on flowers and making seed and burn itself out. And it may not even come back next spring. That's happened with some other more, less or less robust perennials that could happen where they would just die. And Jupiter beard is a really good example of that. Okay. All right, rake out the large leaves of maples, poplars, and sycamores out of your garden beds. Don't allow them just to accumulate for the winter in your garden beds. They will do something that we call pancaking, where they would will layer on top of each other, you know, multiple layers of leaves, and then they kind of get compressed by rain and snow. And when they get compressed, they make an impenetrable barrier to the soil from the air and from moisture. So snow and rain in the spring are not gonna be able to get through those leaves. And then um, the soil is also not going to be able to do gas exchange. It's not going to be able to exchange carbon dioxide for oxygen and roots need oxygen. The plants itself, when plants are in leaf, they need CO2 to make, to photosynthesize. However, the roots need oxygen. And if we're denying gas exchange over the winter um, because there's just this impenetrable barrier, then uh, that's not good for your plants, okay? So make sure you rake those off. Now, if you rake off those leaves and you have the ability to shred them and put them back on the plant, on the beds, you can do that and that will be fine if they're shredded. All right, some fall perennial care. Daylilies, mums, ferns, and hostas. These are all plants that benefit from having their stems just kind of um, collapse on top of the crown of the plant and protect it for winter. So you can leave those alone completely unless you have had daylily rust or a rust disease on your hostas. And you would know that you do have that just by rust colored streaks on the leaves and the stems. If you have that, then those should be cut completely, those stems and uh, discarded. And you can possibly mulch a little bit around your plants to protect them. But for the most part, the leaves are the best way to protect them. Oh, bearded iris. Bearded iris are one of my favorite plants. I have really beautiful bearded iris that are black. And um, they require some maintenance, but it's not maintenance that's too much of a, a hassle, unless this happens to you. So my bearded iris, this is after I cleaned the bed out one day and um, realized that I hadn't separated my bearded iris in about five years. And so when I did separate them, they were, there was like three layers of rhizomes and they shouldn't be like that. So you wanna make sure that you're separating them um, when you're supposed to. But as far as fall care goes for iris, the your iris clump needs to be cleaned out. There should be no weeds growing in there. Uh, there should be no mulch in between your rhizomes because that can harbor the um, iris borer and the iris borer can just run through an entire clump of iris and destroy them. And uh, it's really bad. It's If it happens to you, it really stinks. It's happened to me once. And pulled all my bulbs out. I treated them, put them right back in. I've never had it ever again because I keep it clean. You can mulch around the outside edge of your iris uh, border, your iris uh, clump, but do not put mulch in between all the bulbs. 
what else do I have down here? Remove your brown uh, leaves in the spring, fall, summer, winter, all year long. Get out there, pull off anything that's brown. Um, I'll even go out and do it if the snow has melted in February or early March. Early March. I'll go out there and I'll pull the dry ones off. It prevents a lot of fungal disease and um, it just keeps the whole clump healthy. You can cut down your clumps at this time of the year and then you'll get fresh leaves in the spring. Uh, it's not necessary. The one thing you don't wanna do is do this kind of angle cut in the summer because the iris borer larva can crawl right down into the bulb through the leaves, through the two layers of leaves uh, in the summertime. So by the time summertime comes, all of these cut leaves are going to be dried up and will be removed. And you can see, if you look closely in the very center of this photo, there's a whole new set of fan leaves that are coming up for next spring. So, um, yeah. So you can cut them in the fall just to keep your clump tidy. There's no other reason to do it in the fall other than to keep things looking tidy. That's my point. <laughs> okay, some more fall perennial care. You can divide these following perennials in the fall. And by fall, I mean right around Labor Day. So oriental poppies, peonies, hostas, and daylilies. They can all be um, divided in the fall. However, the one thing about oriental poppies I've learned from myself and from other gardeners is that they really don't do well when you separate them. Um, if you were going to propagate them, you would do root cuttings to propagate them. You don't just kind of split them you don't split the clump up like you would normally think about like a hosta or a daylily. The structure underneath the ground is really not the same as those, um, but they do need all winter to be able to recover from that. But it do, it's not always very successful. So my suggestion would be either go out and buy a second clump of oriental poppies if you want some, some more or buy packages of seeds and grow your own. They do winter so very well. Peonies and hosta and daylilies. Peony, uh, Labor Day is traditionally when Master Gardener, what we learn in Master Gardener class, is that peonies um, should, be, should be replanted, split and replanted at Labor Day weekend. And then replanted with no mulch in between the stems, mulch only around the drip area of the leaves, and then um, only two inches below the soil line. If your peonies, are too deep, they will not bloom. So if you have peonies in your garden right now that maybe they haven't bloomed in a couple of years or something like that, it, the reason is most likely because new soil has built up on top of your roots. And so it's time to lift them. And then hosta and daylily, you can, you can separate them in the fall, but I really do think that they do better in the spring. But that's just my opinion. Uh, lots of people split them in the fall um, and have really good success. And uh, I think if I had a very, very expensive hybrid tetraploid daylily, I would not risk splitting it in the fall. However, um, I would split it in the spring or maybe never. I, I've been burned before. You spend $60 on a daylily, you don't necessarily want to ever like disturb it. So uh, but Stelladoro daylilies, let's go back to this. Stelladoro daylilies, if you have those, geez, you can cut those up any time of the year you want. As long as you can put water on them, you can split those, those exact daylilies, you can split them any time you want. They're so tough. So some are tougher than others. Okay, some more fall perennial care. If you have to cut down the whole garden, um, then you should wait until after several uh, killing frosts so that you know that the weather isn't going to get warmed up again and that your plants won't be tempted to re-sprout because again that would take away energy from the spring stems to come up. So make sure that you don't do that and if you cut back uh, make sure you leave a stump above the soil line uh, for two reasons because you need to know where you have a plant and the second reason is so that you don't accidentally cut into that crown tissue and damage it. 
You don't want to do that. Now is the time. Now that we've had a couple of cold nights, cannas are starting to die back. Da uh, dahlias are starting to die back. Uh, elephant ear are starting to die back. Tube roses, if you have them, tuberous begonias. All of these plants are best harvested after one to two cold nights, maybe not a frost, but a cold night. Um, my cannas are already starting to die because um, they're in a pot and so they've had a couple of cold nights. So I'll probably cut them off and dig them up and store them in a box. And then um, what you wanna do is store them in a ventilated container. A cardboard box really does well, lined with newspaper and you can put in some sphagnum peat moss uh, or you can just put in some potting soil, sterile potting soil, brand new potting soil, not reused. You want something that you know has no diseases and no critters in it uh, to support your cannas over the winter. That material, whether it be potting soil or peat, uh, should be slightly moist, just slightly moist. When you take up these bulbs in the spring, in the fall, whatever the, whichever bulbs you're taking up off of this list, never split them in the fall, dry them off in like on trays in the garage, do not wash them and don't cut them. Do all of that in the spring. Just let them dry out for a couple of weeks and then put them into their storage container for the winter um, and they should be just fine. Now is the time to start collecting seeds of annuals and perennials. Um, if you are really, really into seed collecting like I am, um, then you might want to look at my seed collecting uh, class, which is also on the same YouTube page that this lecture is going to appear on. And that's the IUN Community Garden YouTube page. There is a link for that and a listing of all of our classes on the IUN uh, website for the community garden. So that's a nice concise list. We just saw that this morning in one of our other meetings and um, it's really easy to find things on there. And so seed collecting can be confusing and it can be time consuming if you don't know what you're doing and it can also be very disappointing. So if you need some tips and hints about that, um, my other lecture is a really good one for that. But um, what I was going to say is that if you're really into collecting seed, then you should be collecting seed back at the end of May. There are certain natives and certain other plants that you would start collecting seeds way back at the end of the May. For example, wild geranium, if that's a seed that you needed or wanted, this is not the time of the year to go seek out that seed. That seed should have been collected in June. You should seek out those flower heads in May put blossom bag over the top and then um, collect those seeds in June and because uh, they kind of eject the, the seed head kind of opens up and it ejects the seeds and they and that's why they spread really easily. Um, but now is a good time to collect seeds of late summer blooming natives and other perennials. Um, some of the things that I collected this week were uh, snapdragons. I collected toothache plant. Um, milkweed, ironweed will be this week. Um, I'm trying to picture my garden. And I collected balloon flower, which is um, non-native. It's not balloon milkweed, it's balloon flower, platyacoto. And then um, these things should be stored in paper bags for a few weeks before you gather the seed up and store them into small envelopes or little containers, uh, like little, um, little seed containers. What I buy, uh, I use prescription bottles because they're good. I just wash them out. But I've also bought these, you know, these from McCormick uh, Spices. You can get these off of Amazon. And it's like a one and a half ounce seed container. And it's absolutely perfect for about as much seed as the average gardener is gonna gather from their garden. Now, if you've ever seen those big um, pretzel containers, <laughs> I have filled those too. So um, my seed collecting ha has uh, actually constricted quite a bit. I don't didn't collect as much this year as I have in the past, um, but that should all be starting to be done now before those seeds really release and go flying off into the garden and flying off into the neighborhood. Um, 
Okay. And when you're out there, make sure that you take a marker with you and write your name, write the name of the plant on the paper bag. You can use small little paper bags and um, do that as you are collecting. Do not depend on your memory and say, oh, I'm going to label this when I get in the house because I, you know, I can, by eye, I can identify about 150 different types of seeds. Um, but even I get confused sometimes. So don't depend on your memory. Fall mulching. If you're going to mulch the whole garden before winter, I would say do it um, after some several frosts. Um, kind of clean up the garden a little bit so you can access all the, the places where you have to mulch. And then um, mulch, the, I would say that the primo way to do it is after the soil is frozen because then you know you won't be drowning any of your plants. And then um, in April, remove any mulch that got on top of perennials, which is why it's so important to keep some stem there. And the benefits of fall mulching is going, especially for a brand new garden, is going to be that it's going to prevent your seeds and your perennials from heaving. And it's going to protect any seeds that you have on the ground and it will maintain constant soil temperature. So those are the winter benefits. And then the summer benefits of mulch are that it keeps the soil cool and it keeps moisture in the soil. Lots of benefits to mulch. Prepare your roses for winter. Uh, this is now the preferred way of protecting roses for winter. We do not use styrofoam cones anymore. And this comes down from the American Rose Society. And um, they started talking about no rose cones several years ago. And um, so what you can do is take the bottom out of a cardboard box, put it around your rose. And, and if you have shrub roses, like knockout roses and things like that, you probably don't need to protect them. But this is going to be for more fancy roses, roses that have a graft. That graft, by the way, should be below the ground, four to five inches. Um, but protecting your roses like this is going to be ideal. So what this man has done is uh, cut a bottom out of a box, put it around their shrub, and then um, filled it up with shredded leaves. You can also use peat if you want to, uh, and then you can cover it with your Christmas tree boughs for that deep winter cold. And um, that's what I usually do with my Christmas tree boughs. I save them and I throw them over my garden. I'll get my brother's Christmas trees. Um, they give me their Christmas trees. We cut up the stems, throw them on top of the car, bring them home, and then um, put them on the garden. Okay, uh, preparing your climbing roses for winter. Again, don't fertilize these plants after August 15th. Same with all of your other roses. You're gonna prune climbing roses in late November to December uh, and after the plant is two years old. If your plant is younger than two years, you really don't have to do anything. You need this plant to not worry about making new branches in the spring. You want them to worry about establishing roots and just by leaving it alone, that's what you're telling it to do. Um, anything that is old and twiggy and less vigorous on an older plant, you can take those out. And then your long flexible canes should be secured to whatever trellis or support that you have for it because that will keep the wind from whipping them around and breaking them. So. Um, certain grapevines and clematis can be pruned in late fall also. If you have new broadleaf weeds, uh, evergreens, uh, new boxwood uh, azaleas that keep their leaves, rhododendrons, anything that keeps their leaves over the winter that is not a fine needle pine will benefit from being sprayed with an anti-desiccant solution and wilt proof is one of those. It's Basically, it's the only one on the market. Uh, wilt proof is great. It's made of pine resin and, um, and water. It's sprayable. You spray it on top of the leaves, underneath the leaves, and it keeps your broadleaf evergreens from losing water over the winter. And I find that this really only needs to be done for the first couple of winters until those little shrubs are established, and then they can really, um, they can survive on their own. But until the roots are very established and mature, they run the risk of losing a lot of moisture through those leaves during the winter time. So it's, it's better to keep them protected. 
give them a little bit of fertilizer in the winter time too, in November. Um, just evergreen fertilizer, it's very generic. There's shrub fertilizer, tree fertilizer out there. There's evergreen fertilizer. Um, and I think Espoma makes one called Azalea Tone. I think Rhododendron Tone maybe. Uh, new shrubs need to be protected for winter. They should be mulched relatively heavy, but not up to the stem. Make sure that the stem stays clear, but there is a nice layer of mulch around the roots the root zone. Um, you can support them with burlap. If your shrub is on the northeast corner of the house, like this one was, this is my Nico blue hydrangea that I bought for like $17 as a stick from Spring Hill Nursery. If you guys remember Spring Hill Nursery, I bought this Nico blue hydrangea probably 20 years ago. And um, the first winter after I moved it, this is what I did. I put a double layer of burlap around it just to keep that Northwest wind off of it. And it did really well, survived through the winter. It doesn't bloom a whole lot because I don't put, uh, I don't feed it a lot. So it doesn't continuously bloom all summer because I'm telling you, they, these are very hungry plants and these macrophylla hydrangeas, if you want them to bloom, they need just a really diluted solution of fertilizer, you know, like four times during the summer to just get them to bloom. Pruning wisteria in the fall. I'm not going to get into this really deeply, except to explain a couple of things. Wisteria need to be on a very, very strong support. It should be made of metal. Um, chain link fence is not always the best choice because the way it wraps around itself onto anything that it is put on chain link. If you ever had to remove your vine, um, it would really be a nightmare trying to get it off the chain link. <clears throat> um, you need to prune them like three times a year, August, March, and February. Oh, sorry. Um, August, March to February. And then again, you can root prune in October. So I guess it needs to be pruned twice a year. And here is a graphic that will help you. Now I sent along with your handouts for this class, um, a fact sheet from Ohio State on how to take care of wisterias. And they have a list on that fact sheet of about eight um, cultivars of wisteria, but those are Chinese wisteria. If you can stick with our native, which is Kentucky uh, wisteria. And if you do the proper pruning, the way this um, diagram shows in the other diagram over here, oh, sorry, the diagram on your uh, handout, then this is most likely what you're gonna end up with. You're gonna have a really, really floriferous plant. Now, if you have a wisteria and it's never bloomed before, that's where root pruning in October comes root pruning it um, really late in the fall will trick it into thinking that it's older. It will start storing more food in its roots and then it will bloom in spring. You can also give it a small, a very small, like I'm saying like a half a cup of triple superphosphate late, late in fall. And triple superphosphate is an extremely strong fertilizer you don't wanna mess around with it. You don't wanna get it in your head, like some gardeners do that more, more is better with fertilizer because it's never the truth. That is never the truth with fertilizer. And if you're going to use triple superphosphate, um, you, can, you can do it on this, but very, very little. So this wisteria is one of the things and hydrangea are, are two of the things that I call hard to bloom plants. So these are plants that you've had hanging around the garden and they just won't bloom. They're very stubborn. You don't know what to do. And this is where the triple superphosphate can really help out. But again, very, very little. You, a little Phosphate stays in the soil for years. And that doesn't mean that it's a bad thing. It means that it stays in the soil. It does not translocate into different places in the garden or the yard. It stays where you put it and it's available to your plants for many years. That's what that means. And um, sometimes that's what wisteria and hydrangea, some clematis and peonies need just to get them up over the hump so that they can bloom. Um, 
and then and you want to do that again late late winter late fall sorry late fall all right you can plant new trees at this time of the year this is the time of the year that the nurseries are all trying to sell all their tree stock so sometimes you can get really great deals on new trees and um, planting trees when they're dormant is a great way to get them to establish over the winter they um, they do well growing some roots over the winter a couple of important things about planting a new tree your hole needs to be pretty wide compared to the size of the ball of the tree and the ball of your tree should be planted so that it is sticking up out of the soil maybe one or two inches and then um, you don't have to take the cage off of a tree the cage is the wire basket that holds the whole thing together when it's above ground you can take it off you don't have to take it off but you really should at least peel back the burlap um, off the top of the ball i would suggest that because if you mulch and you miss an area and you have um, any burlap sticking up into the air that will act like a wick and it will pull the moisture out of the the ball of the tree and the tree could die over winter so you want to try and prevent that so this diagram is not in your um, handouts however this diagram is really really popular on the internet and you should be able to look it up really easily um, anything else that we need to know you don't have to stake a new tree when you put it in the ground unless it's a pine tree pine trees really do need to be staked for a couple of years um, other trees don't really need to be staked all right if you have questions about that throw it in the chat planting spring bulbs is really fun i have probably planted five thousand bulbs in my garden and i'm not even joking there was about five years there where I was planting a lot of bulbs, maybe six or seven years. And um, I did keep a diary and a list of all my bulbs. And I went through and count, counted it one year and it was a few thousand, um, which is ridiculous, especially when you see the picture. But why do we plant bulbs? If you don't have any bulbs at all, I encourage you to plant a few because the best thing about planting bulbs is having spring be extended, having winter shortened. That's what I like about it. Seeing those crocus in the third week of March every year is a really wonderful symbol to me that winter's done. You know, it's time to start looking at um, getting some things out for the spring, you know, getting out the garden art and my little gnomes. Yes, I do have a collection of garden gnomes. And, um, you know, just starting to get the, the season started but you don't wanna cut down anything in your garden just yet. You wanna wait until mid to late April for that. So um, bulbs are super easy to plant. They give great color. They extend your season by six to eight weeks, depending on what you plant. And you can plant crocus, you can plant snowdrops. And um, what's the other really, really early? No, snowdrops is the really early one. And those will bloom sometimes at the beginning of February or the beginning of March for us. And so snowdrops are a really good one to plant. However, squirrels like them. So you have to be careful with that. Um, I'll, I'll talk about squirrels in a minute. I'll address that in a minute because people do have problems with bulbs, with squirrels. So um, one of the things about bulbs is I really prefer a more natural look of bulbs. So I usually plant them in small clumps. Um, planting in odd numbers is great. It gives a really good ma maximum visual impact. And um, if you plant in a pattern, make sure that you needed to plant in a pattern or want to plant in a pattern, because otherwise the people who you and your viewers of your garden are gonna just see that pattern and that's all they're gonna just see. They're just gonna see a blob of color and say, that's a pattern. It's a straight line, it's a square, it's a rectangular. It's a rectangle. and the whole idea I think of bulbs is to making them look really naturalized and not, not the Bouchard garden style, which is very, very rigid and very planned. So with that in mind, prepare yourselves. This is what my garden looked like 10 years ago, 12 years ago. Um, it doesn't quite look like this anymore because I started thinning out my daffodils, especially my poeticus daff daffodils. Those are the white ones down in the front on the left. Um, it really, I always describe it as it, it looked like a clown threw up in my garden and it really does look like that. Uh, not as much anymore though. 
So I thinned them out a bit, uh, which is not a bad thing, but I really love how colorful it is. And I'll tell you what, my neighbors love this. My neighbors love the daffodils. They love seeing the tulips. They love the crocus in the spring. Um, it's really wonderful because almost no one else in my garden, in my neighborhood has bulbs except me. I think very, very few people. So some things about planting bulbs. Um, plant larger bulbs farther from view. Plant your red bulbs farther from view because they're easy to see. If you want anything that's in any kind of lilac or pale pink or pale purple or dark purple color, those colors should be up close to your visual area. So your front walk, your garden, your patio, um, smaller minor bulbs and the most fragrant bulbs should be planted near where you're gonna be sitting and near where you come in and out of your house. Um, a dark green background is a really great background for your bulbs. So if you do have evergreens, plant some big red tulips in front of there, plant some daffodils in front of there, but make sure they're like the really big tall ones. Um, and that would be Darwin tulips. And then um, there is a very, very large daffodil out there and I can't remember the name right now. If you need me to, I'll look it up for you. But evergreens make a really great background for bulbs. A Couple of other things about planting bulbs. Uh, you usually, the directions will say, plant your bulbs two and a half times the height of your bulb. Uh, large bulbs should be planted eight to 12 inches deep and your small bulbs about four to six inches deep. So I always, I always try to plant my bulbs just slightly deeper than what the, um, the growers instructions are, mostly because of squirrels. Don't worry too much about spacing your bulbs. Uh, when I do plant my bulbs, I don't plant them singly. I will plant them in a big hole so if I'm planting, say, a dozen tulips, I will dig a hole 12 inches wide, you know, roughly 12 inches deep, okay? So deeper is better with tulips because then they perennialize. And um, I will put those tulip bulbs in the bottom of that hole and I will put one alien bulb in the middle and that will keep the squirrels away. You can dig a trench for these bulbs too. Um, daffodils, the more shallow the daffodils are planted, the more they will multiply or the faster they'll multiply. Um, when you plant them and cover them with a layer of soil, you can put in a little bit of fertilizer halfway up, you know, in that soil, you kind of backfill halfway and put a little, a little bit of fertilizer and then, or fertilizer underneath the bulbs too is okay mixed in with the soil. Um, okay. You can plant bulbs in containers too. I've never tried it, but how do you beat the squirrels? You beat the squirrels by, first of all, accepting that they eat tulips, they eat snowdrops, they eat crocus. Okay. So a couple of ways you can beat them from getting into this is by planting alliums and you can plant summer alliums or you can plant spring alliums. You, the spring alliums are the big ones, the, the very large purple balls. You can mix garlic powder in with the bone meal or your fertilizer that you are going to put with your bulbs in the hole. And then um, you, when you backfill your hole with your bulbs in it, uh, just like you did before, like I said before, you fill about halfway, you can put a little fertilizer, but put your garlic powder in backfill completely, pat that soil down and put more, gar more garlic powder over the top. Garlic powder is really going to become your friend if you have a problem with squirrels. Um, they also don't like white vinegar, but I caution you against doing something like dunking your bulbs into white vinegar because white vinegar can kill plants and people do use it as a weed killer. So why are we gonna put it on our bulbs? So you'll, you sometimes will hear white vinegar as a use for this, but I, I really caution you against it because of that whole aspect that it will kill um, plants. So um, go out and buy garlic powder in the cheapest place you can buy garlic powder in the biggest container you can find it because you're going to use a lot of it if you want to plant a lot of bulbs or if you have a big squirrel pr problem. I have what I think are just two squirrels in my garden, but they have done a lot of damage this year. So um, 
I'm at a constant odds with those little stinkers. So the alliums in this picture are the big purple balls. And then the big, the big pink balls are my two, my peonies. So um, this is not what my garden looked like this year. This picture is not from this year. This is from several years ago when I first planted those alliums. And when those alliums, before those alliums came up and bloomed, there were tulips around each one of them. Uh, but I have since let them kind of naturalize in the garden. And when I had my plant sale this summer, I sold about 250 bulbs because I just let my garden go for a few years. And it is by no means am I saying that allium bulbs are a pest. But if you leave them alone and you don't do a lot of weeding in your garden and manipulation of the soil, they do drop bulblets, which are very, very tiny little bulbs that fall off of the flower stem from the top. Um, and they can also drop seeds and so they'll multiply. So mine kind of got naturalized a little too much. So I shared them. A couple more things for you to do during the, the fall is to clean up your garden tools. Get the mud off of your garden tools and uh, put them away for the winter. Hang them up above the ground. Don't let them touch concrete because they will get rusty because concrete gets wet during the winter. Um, make sure that you have uh, epoxied your tool handles back together if you have lost a handle. And uh, a really good waterproof glue for that is Gorilla Glue. It's a great glue to use uh, for this type of application. Sharpen the blades of your tools for the winter. That way you don't have to worry about doing it in the spring. And you can spray them with WD-40 and wipe them clean. Um, we no longer do the whole sand in the garden bucket and pour a bottle of oil in it. So if your grandfather did that and you think that's the right way to do it still, it's really not because if you ever have to get rid of that bucket full of sand and oil, how do you get rid of it? There's no way to get rid of it. So just try not to do it. Just use WD-40. It's better for the environment at least. Um, store your garden tools in a bin or a drawer. Uh, box, anything. Again, long handle tools should be hung off the floor. Chemicals that you bought this year should be dated and brought in from a outdoor shed or an outdoor garage, an unattached garage. If your garage freezes over the winter, you really shouldn't have any liquid chemicals out there. If you have any kind of like liquid fertilizers or anything like that. Um, drain your hoses, put them in the garage and store your garden art in the garage. Don't leave it out over the winter because it'll fade. And then take in your ceramic pots because nothing's worse than having a ceramic pot split down the middle and having a bungee cord around your terracotta pots is not an attractive way to display your succulents. So make sure you pick them up and you don't necessarily have to empty them. You just have to get them in so they are not going to uh, be wet constantly during the winter. With our winter freeze and thaw cycle, the soil will expand and contract and it will split your ceramic and your terracotta pots. And then a few other fall tips. Uh, this is a little too late for right now, but plant your mums as early as possible. If you want yellow mums, that would be very easy for you to do because you can buy them in May in the garden centers. Seems like there's always yellow mums in the garden centers around Mother's Day. Uh, if you want any other kind of colors of mums, as soon as you start seeing them at the grocery stores, go to an independent garden center and buy them there. Um, let's keep those independent garden centers in, in uh, the black. It's really important. And then uh, some of the other things you can do around the yard is make sure you don't have any tall grass growing around the base of your trees. Make sure to trim that because that's where voles and, and mice will nest over the winter under the snow and they will eat your trees. They will eat your tree trunks. And then spray your house plants off before bringing them in the house. Now, if you haven't brought your house plants in, you can spray them with neem oil. Or another trick that I have learned from another master gardener is to fill up a wash bin with uh, just hose water and maybe a little bit of dish soap and then dunk all of your uh, houseplant pots in that water and leave it for 30 minutes to an hour because the infusion of the water into the plant roots, into the root zones 
will um, push the air out and it will kill any insects in your pots of plants, which I think is genius. Make sure to turn off your outdoor faucets if they are not the kind that completely drain when you turn them off at the house. Um, I have one of those, but not two. I have one very complicated uh, outdoor configuration for one of my spigots and it is very tricky. Uh, we've had to replace the piping several times. So make sure you turn off any outdoor faucets that are at risk of splitting and um, water your plants, especially brand new trees and shrubs until the soil is completely frozen. So if you do plant a new tree and we have a pretty dry uh, period of time from the end of November or the end of October to the end of November, make sure that you water those new trees and shrubs a couple of times. Make sure they don't dry out completely. Some other things for fall other than preparing um, to bring seeds in the house, start thinking about how you are gonna start those seeds over the winter. No matter what method of seed starting that you are going to use, make sure that you're buying the potting soil right now from an independent garden center. And then um, you can think about winter sowing. That's the milk jug method. And that I teach also, we have that on our list of classes too for IUN garden, community garden. Um, if you're gonna winter sow, you're gonna need a little bit more soil than you would if you're gonna do trays in the house. The great thing about winter sowing is you don't need trays in the house. You don't need soil to stay in the house. You don't need lights. You don't need shelving. You don't need all of that kind of stuff. You don't have to worry about watering every single day. You water just about seven to eight times during the winter outside because the jugs go outside. Um, but if you're gonna consider gar uh, winter sowing, start gathering up your one gallon jugs now, gather up your seeds, make sure you buy your potting soil. What else will you need? Uh, duct tape is the other thing that you're gonna need, okay? And you don't have to use one gallon jugs, you can use other containers too. But again, this is a gigantic list of things that I just went through. And again, they're just all suggestions. Some of these things might not even fit you at all. You might not even be interested um, in any of this at all. <laughs> but I would think that you're interested in doing some kind of cleanup free fall if you're here. So just, just so you know, this isn't a mandatory list. Um, if you did all of these things on the list, it doesn't mean that you're gonna have the perfect garden next year. So um, no one ever has a perfect garden. It just doesn't happen. But an inventory is a useful thing to have a, a plant inventory. If, you, if that's one thing that you wanted to work on, you could take photos this fall of your garden, nice tight shots, nice long shots of your garden. That would be a great way to, to do something over the winter uh, with your garden and to keep up with things. And that's all I have for you. Do you guys have questions? Dolly, there is an earlier question regarding the um, rose cones and why they're no longer recommended for the winter protection. Oh, great question. Rose cones are not generally recommended anymore because they can, in our climate where we have freeze and thaw periods, they can act like a little greenhouse. You know how we always have that thaw period uh, towards the middle of January or the middle of February? you know, where everybody decides to throw open their windows and doors for the day because it's 65 degrees and air out the house. Um, periods like that are really bad with the rose cones because if they get warm inside, the leaves will start to sprout. And then as soon as it get cold, gets cold again after a few days, those leaves die. And all that does is use, uses up energy that's in the plant's roots that it's going to need in spring when it really puts out its spring leaves. And if it doesn't have that energy, then that plant runs the risk of dying. Uh, incidentally, if you have a lot of squirrel problems, but you really want spring bulbs, but you're like, oh, I really don't wanna go through the hassle of the garlic powder and the allium and all that, but you want spring bulbs, go with daffodils because daffodils are poisonous to all creatures. Nobody will eat daffodils. Um, nobody will touch them. So, and the good thing about daffodils is that there are really, really early spring daffodils all the way through to very late daffodils. And you could mix up a really nice um, spring show with just daffodils. Okay. So that's a good thing to know. 
All right. Well, once again, Sally, thank you so much for taking the time to present today. Thank you to all of our attendees as well. Bye-bye, everybody. Thanks for coming.